Russia has launched an air offensive on Ukraine for the fourth straight day, this time targeting the Kyiv region with Iranian-made kamikaze drones. Now, people in the Ukrainian capital woke to the sounds of air raid sirens early on Thursday. The president's office said critical infrastructure was damaged in the attack. There's been no comment on potential casualties. Now, the attack comes just hours after the United Nations General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to condemn Russia's attempts to illegally annex four regions of Ukraine. The resolution was supported by 143 countries, while 35 states abstained, including China and India. I asked DW's Fanny Fachar, who's in Kyiv, if people there see these latest Russian strikes as Moscow's response to the UN vote. Well, it's very difficult to look into the head of Vladimir Putin, why he's doing what, when. Uh, certainly pretty much every day now, actually, people are getting used to these air raid alerts here in Kyiv City and to new airstrikes in various parts of the country. But before I'm getting to the details of the fresh attacks in uh, certain parts here in Ukraine, let me uh, just look at that UN General Assembly vote and the meaning of it, really, because the fact that three-fourths of the UN General Assembly voted uh, to condemn the attempted annexation of four sovereign regions, basically, of Ukraine, namely uh, Luhansk, Donetsk, Aporizhia and Kherson region, which are only partially occupied, by the way, by Russian forces. This, of course, sends a very strong message to the world, also in terms of trying to drum up more support for Ukraine, a message that what's happening in, and, uh, uh, in Ukraine is just simply not only illegal, but it's against what, uh, uh, what it means to actually maintain the sovereignty of a country. But of course, we should not re, uh, forget all those uh, v countries that abstained from the votes. You have already pointed out China and India, but uh, various African countries as well. Also, the uh, resolution, which is non-binding, so it's not going to uh, mean an end to this war, unfortunately, uh, shows how much Russia is increasingly isolated, however, because aside from Russia, only less than a handful of friends, actually, four other countries voted against this resolution. Non-surprisingly, of course, uh, one of the strongest allies here, uh, Belarus, but also Syria, for example, and North Korea. So with regard to the resolution, yes, it sends a strong message to the world. With regard to the war, it's not going to end it anytime soon. Fanny, what else can you tell us about the latest airstrikes? Once again, uh, Ukraine uh, was hit this time not, not, not by missile attacks, but various uh, drones, drone attacks. Uh, Ukraine claims that these were the so-called kamikaze drones that uh, were supplied by Iran. Uh, Russia never commented, by the way, whether those drones uh, are coming from Iran. But regardless, uh, according to Ukrainian officials, there was quite some damage uh, close to Kiev city, about 50 kilometers from here. Uh, they're pointing at critical infrastructure, but I'm also hearing uh, that emergency units are on the scene, which would actually indicate that residential buildings may have been hit. We do not know yet. We also do not know about number of potentially uh, injured people or even casualties. So we are monitoring that development as well. But what we certainly can uh, say, and that's also quite worrisome, it's not new because Mykolaiv, that, that town in the portal uh, part, in the southern portal part of Ukraine, has been hit quite a few times but again uh, tonight it's been hit uh, uh, or a residential building was hit and there also we don't, do not know yet the exact numbers but this clearly indicates once again regardless of resolutions regardless of uh, different international meetings the horror really especially for civilians here in Ukraine just goes on. Fanny thanks so much that's Fanny Fachar reporting from Kyiv. Now, although Russia claims to be targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure, the barrage of strikes that began on Monday is also hitting residential areas. The latest escalation means people across the country are now living in a state of high alert. Dozens of civilians have been killed, but many more have endured narrow escapes. Battered, bruised and lucky to be alive. Slowly, a young girl emerges from what's left of a building destroyed in a Russian missile attack. Rescuers managing to make a hole just big enough for her to make an escape, followed by her mother and her father. They'd taken shelter in a cellar during another airstrike on the southeast city of Zaporizhia. 
There is little light relief here in the face of Russia's escalation in this war. Silent prayers being said here by candlelight at St Michael's Golden Domed Monastery in the capital, Kyiv. But step outside and you'll find a bleak reminder of the deadly cost of this conflict. A war memorial to Ukraine's fallen soldiers and the constant reminders of the ongoing threat from the skies. I think they can be more dangerous using their missiles. Like, like the day before yesterday, they, they used uh, to hit the critical uh, infrastructure in Ukraine to shut down the electricity, to shut down the warming and everything. On the front line, it's weapons from Ukraine's allies that are helping its forces advance. This US-made grenade launcher is being fired at Russian positions in the eastern region of Donetsk, one of four recently illegally annexed by Moscow. But to win here, these troops say they need more weapons and fast. Ukraine's president is cranking up the pressure on his European allies. Europe is still living in fear. What will Russia do? How will Putin react? And what will happen if he's no longer in power? And how quickly weapons and military support can be delivered to the front lines, strengthening Ukraine's arm in this fight, could now be vital as winter approaches. Meanwhile, some 50 countries allied with Ukraine have announced deliveries of advanced air defence weapons to Kyiv. They were meeting in Brussels alongside a summit of NATO defence ministers. Here's NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg speaking just a short time ago. It uh, is a very important message that uh, NATO allies uh, and partners and the Ukraine defence contact group that you shared uh, delivered yesterday that we will stand by Ukraine for as long as it takes. We will step up our support and in particular we will provide more uh, air defence uh, systems uh, to uh, Ukraine. Earlier I spoke to Raphael Loss, a research fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations and an expert on NATO. And I asked him what finally pushed NATO to supply Ukraine with air defence systems. Well, if you just look at the system that Germany delivered yesterday to Ukraine, the IRST system, then that was announced by Chancellor Olaf Scholz already in June. Um, there is a long lead time um, with industry production. Um, the systems that were delivered from Germany were originally ordered by Egypt. Um, there was some back-channel diplomacy to make it available to Ukraine now. But there is a long lead time to, to get equipment to Ukraine, be it modern air defenses or, or other um, artillery systems that we've been discussing. Um, for the past months already. Um, so it has been taken, uh, the decision quite a while back, and now um, the systems arrive in Ukraine and, and have an effect in protecting civilian um, areas and, and military targets that Russia um, seeks to disrupt and destroy through its missile campaign of the last couple of weeks. Now, NATO members have been mindful about helping without triggering a wider war in Europe, given Russia's warnings against uh, supplying advanced weaponry to Kyiv. How is Russia um, likely to react to this latest boost to Ukraine's missile defence? I think they'll step up a, a step on the on their escalation ladder. We've seen um, various uh, efforts to to meddle with um, uh, infrastructure in Europe. Um, the Nord Stream pipeline comes to mind. Um, we've seen missile barrages aimed at um, civilian targets in Ukraine. Um, what I think all of this indicates is that Russia is recognizing that they have little means to affect the balance of forces on the battlefield and that they now seek to leverage um, other means um, to undermine Western support for Ukraine. And this is certainly going to continue. It's going to escalate further. Um, but nonetheless, as, as NATO leaders have said um, uh, yesterday, and they will repeat this today, um, they're cognizant of the escalation risks and are carefully um, to provide Ukraine with um, uh, equipment that it needs to defend itself. Um, but certainly strings are still attached to the aid that the West is giving. It's just now been confirmed that Germany and 13 other countries will procure their own new air defence systems to, to protect themselves. Can you tell us any more about that? 
integrated air missile defense for a long time was not a priority in the West. When you think of the last 20 years, um, then usually the foreign deployments in Afghanistan and Mali and other places come to mind where Western soldiers didn't face any threats from above, really. Um, and so missile defense wasn't a priority in terms of um, uh, capabilities and in terms of procurement. And that is only slowly changing since 2014, since Russia first attacked Ukraine. And certainly those discussions are picking up since February of this year. Um, now, the announcement by Germany and 13 other countries, I think, is a welcome step to bolster European missile defense capabilities. We'll have to see how this plays out in practice over the next couple of months and, and years. Now, NATO is meeting uh, for a second day on Thursday. It's going to be um, discussing its re-ammunition, so restocking its own arms. How vulnerable has the war in Ukraine actually made NATO? I think that has been um, neglected by, by NATO countries for the longest time. I think um, that resulted initially from a certain um, expectation that the war would soon be over. Um, it turns out that this is a long war um, and that it will take a while. And now industry production for ammunition, but also for spare parts um, of the systems that have been provided to Ukraine already, um, are of higher priority than they were a couple of weeks ago. We're too slow when it comes to adopting to this new challenge. But I think um, uh, NATO leaders at their July summit in Madrid have already indicated um, that they were discussing uh, an industrial response um, to, to Russia's aggression against Ukraine, and that certainly uh, restocking ammunition stockpiles, but also boosting the readiness of their own armed forces is of highest priority to the alliance now. Rafael Loss from the European Council on Foreign Relations. It's been a pleasure having you on DW. Thank you. Thank you.